Hi, I am Michael Wolf. I'm a jazz pianist and composer. Uh, I perform all over the world. I just got back from Europe. I play with my own trio. I played with uh, Ronnie Cuber um, with a quartet for him. I'm playing a lot in New York City now at uh, Zinc, uh, Zinc Bar, Vanguard, Knickerbocker, you know, wherever. And I'm also teaching the R&B Ensemble at the New School for jazz, uh, contemporary, jazz and contemporary music. So I'm doing a lot of different things. And I'm raising a couple of crazy rock and roll star actor kids. And so I'm, that takes up a lot of my time. Uh, and my wife is an actress and, uh, and a writer. She's now getting ready to do a big play in LA. And so we're back and forth. We mainly live in New York City. So I'm just basically just try to keep, you know, when you see those people in the swimming pool and they're treading water and treading water, and that's what I'm trying to do, keep above water. Well, jazz is the, when I'm the most in, comfortable uh, thing that I do. The happiest I ever am is sitting at the piano usually in a group playing jazz and improvising. It's, the, it's my most comfortable moment. I have Tourette syndrome, so I always felt like the piano was the place for me. You know, when I touch that piano, I can be as impulsive as I want. I, I don't have to worry about uh, being good or nice or repressing myself or, you know, and I can just be totally instinctual. It's the most free that I ever feel. So jazz, just for my own selfish personal thing, you know, is the most important thing for me. But I do a lecture on a thing where I just say you can live your life with the jazz concept. And the jazz concept to me is to study really hard, learn everything you can academically, scholastically, learn all the forms, learn all that, and then do what you feel in the moment. You improvise. And I think that's the way that I like to approach life. Uh, well, I'm so lucky because I got to go on the road very young. At 19 years old, I joined Cal Jader's band, a Latin jazz uh, vibist actually Swedish. Then I went from Cal to Ayrto Marrero and Flora Perim and I played with them for a year. Fantastic learning of Brazil right when it was happening in 1974. You know, yeah, Mike, we're going to play some 7-4, you know. Ayrto was very fun. Ayrto, man. And then the gig uh, that was the most important to me and meant the most important to me was I was the last pianist with Cannonball Adderley. And I played with him in 75. And under a year, he, he had a stroke while I was in the band. But playing with him, I had grown up loving Miles and Cannon. Those were my two favorite musicians, so I knew all the material. It was his brother Nat on cornet, Walter Booker on bass, and Roy McCurdy on drums. And I was writing all the music for the band, and had he lived, the next album was going to be all my own stuff. But, you know, that was a real blow for my career to have Cannonball Day at that time. And, you know, besides how much I loved him, he really believed in me and loved me, and I think the next five years would have been super important. You know, Cannonball the Man was such a wonderful, um, loving, enthusiastic guy. I mean, you know, Cannonball, I mean, they, you know, he, uh, I'll just say he had some personal demons to deal with, as did many people in the business uh, at that time. In the 70s, you know, we were all into a lot of stuff we shouldn't have been into, and Cannon was right up there. But, you know, I have to say that he was just, he, he was, you know, I can just be personal. He was so happy with me. He said, you're putting new blood in the blood. And, what he was was just open and encouraging. And he said, you know, you're so lucky you're not hung up with a bebop style. He said, Quincy Jones and I are trying to get that last foot out of Birdland. He said, bebop is hanging me up. I want to soar with my music and I'm stuck with this saxophone style. And he was really frustrated. So I was coming from a post-bop thing. I, I came up more with Bitches Brew and Headhunters and, you know, the straight ahead stuff would have been more like ARC by Chick and Now He Sings, Now He Sobs and that kind of stuff, you know, more free and Keith Jarrett and all that. So for me, uh, I was just writing what I was writing. You know, Zawinul was a big influence on me, as he had been on Cannon. So Cannon was trying to get free, and I was so impressed. When I, when I first joined the band, I said, well, Cannon, you know, I had been in New York, scuffling to learn Moments Notice and Giant Steps and all the things everybody was learning at the, at the jam sessions. And I said, Cannon, could we play Moments Notice or Giant Steps? And he goes, no, we don't play exercises on our bandstand. Why don't you write me some music? He says, now, John Coltrane was my favorite saxophonist, but those were exercises for him. So I learned a lot from him. He said, play the piano, play what you know all over the piano, and never let anybody tell you how to play. So he would, for me personally, gave me a lot of confidence. And uh, he was a very, you know, learned guy. I mean, he, you know, well-read, had gone to college. You know, he very politically talked about the Vietnam War all the time. And he showed me that if you talk to the audience, and he talked to the audience a lot. He was really funny. He talked to the audience between songs. He introduced the band. He talked about the politics of the day, the local things, whatever was on his mind. But he told me, the more you talk to the audience and get them uh, to see you, your vulnerability and your openness as a person, the further you could take them out musically. So that's one thing I learned, and I did a lot of stand-up and acting and all that, so I love to talk to the audience, and I think that that helps. Uh, a, a parent uh, a of a, 
of a student once asked me, do you think my kid learning to play jazz is like becoming a stagecoach driver? I said, no, I think you could get a gig as a stagecoach driver. Mm -hmm.